Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Ask Me Anything virtual series hosted by the University of Georgia Alumni Association. My name is Debbie Daniel. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement for the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. The Franklin College has been the cornerstone of the University of Georgia since 1801. We are the oldest, largest, and most academically diverse college at the University of Georgia. As a matter of fact, the top five most popular undergraduate majors at UGA are housed within the Franklin College. Those are biology, psychology, English, art, and history. Franklin is the beginning. The numerous departments in the Franklin College offer courses that create an entry into a wide variety of careers. And our introductory courses meet requirements for and support all academic programs at UGA. So each alum joining us today actually started at the Franklin College and we are delighted to have you join us today. I am privileged to serve as the moderator for today's session of Zombies, Sports and Cola, Implications for Communicating Complex Science Topics like Climate, like climate Change and Coronavirus. To discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome one of Franklin College's finest and our very special guest, Dr. Marshall Shepard, the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at UGA. He is a leading international expert in weather and climate. Dr. Shepard currently serves as the director of the University of Georgia's Atmospheric Sciences Program and is a full professor in the Department of Geography. He is also the host of Weather Channel's award-winning show, Weather Geeks, and is a contributor to Forbes magazine. Now, Dr. Shepard has many, many awards and very high honors. Too many to name them all as our time would run out. But just to name a few, we have uh, some recent honors, such as the 2020 Manny L. Baumick Award for Public Engagement with Science from the American Association for Advancement of Science the 2019 recipient of the AGU Climate Communication Prize and the 2018 recipient of the prestigious AMS Helmut Landsberg Award for pioneering and significant work in urban climate. Now, prior to UGA, Dr. Shepard spent about 12 years as a research meteorologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and was deputy project scientist for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission a multinational space mission that launched in 2014. So with no further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Dr. Shepard, who will succinctly describe his work for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we will answer questions. So please be thinking about questions that you would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and also for not reading my entire bio. <laughs> I always like that. Hey, all, uh, first of all, let me give a hearty go dogs. I had to pull out uh, one of my um, Georgia athletic shirts today. Um, I'm missing all Georgia sports. I, I, in addition to being a professor at UGA and having all those accolades, I actually serve on the Georgia uh, Athletic Association board as well. So a uh, big time uh, dogs fan as well. But I'm gonna spend about 15 minutes with you talking about a topic and just give me a moment here where I, where I transition my screen and then we'll get going. Although the host, uh, if you can hear me, it says you have disabled the share for disabled screen sharing. So I think the host needs to enable it so that I can share my screen. And while they do that, I will just give you a little bit of my background. I grew up in Canton, Georgia, Cherokee County for anyone out there that knows is I did my undergraduate bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Florida State University. So I am a Florida State Seminole, but I'm also a bulldog. And I went to NASA before coming to the University of Georgia. So let's see if we can share that screen now. Looks like we can. Okay, so I, here's my talk, Zombie Sports and Cola, Implications for Communicating complex science topics. And I promise you that by the end of this 15 minutes, 
that topic or that title will make sense because I'm certain that somebody tuned in and said, all right, where's he going with that title? So let's just dive in. What I'm showing you there is a cyclone or a hurricane, if you will, in the Indian Ocean as we speak. It's actually headed for India and Bangladesh. This was uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest cyclone ever recorded in that region. It's a really interesting storm for me as a meteorologist because it's a very strong storm. But interestingly enough, it's headed towards a very populated region that's like us dealing with coronavirus. And so I'd say there's some complexity to that problem. In fact, here's a look at the COVID-19 trends in India, the blue line. So you can clearly see that like the rest of the world, that part of the world is dealing with coronavirus. And then you throw on top of that possibly the strongest cyclone that they've ever seen, really. And so this gives us a look at what the challenges are in terms of communicating complex science topics. Now, I deal mostly with weather and climate change, but I'm going to talk a little bit about coronavirus, too. There are my coordinates there on the top of the screen. If you want to follow me on Twitter, at Dr. Shepard 2013, I keep it popping over there on Twitter, so definitely come over there and follow me if you want. Check out the podcast that I host for the Weather Channel called Weather Geeks. It used to be a TV show as well. And uh, I write for Forbes. And I, I've done a lot of things, but today I want to talk about the complexity of science. This image that you see here is Tropical Storm Arthur that just uh, grazed North Carolina just yesterday and last night. Uh, a bit early to be having a named storm because hurricane season doesn't start until June 1st, but for the last six or seven years, we've seen storms before June 1st, and that may be a sign of climate change. I'll say a little bit more about climate change in a moment. But let's, let's, we love the Bulldogs. So let's, I wanted to start there. Here's a look at our, our team lined up to take a snap and run a play against Vanderbilt. Now, as they run that play, there are multiple outcomes, scenarios, and uncertainties after this play happens. How do you interpret them, assess the likely result of the play, and evaluate the effectiveness of the play? Now, I'm talking about football or sports. There's part of the title, by the way, in this particular example. But the answers to those questions will depend upon our biases, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, wish casting, preparation, skill, and analysis. I'm going to talk about each of those here momentarily, but think about it for a second. The outcome of that play, if you're a Bulldogs fan like we are, you're going to want that play to go for 40 or 50 yards and score a touchdown. Uh, so you're, you may not be looking at whether we actually have the right play set up or what the positions and whatnot are like. Then there's something called Dunning-Kruger effect. You've all done it. We've, we're all guilty of this. If you're sitting there watching the game, you're like, why Coach Smart? Why are you running that play? You should have run this play. Dunning-Kruger is this notion that we know more than the experts. People know more than they think they do about certain topics. Now, as a meteorologist and a climate scientist, I deal with that all the time. Then there's something called wish casting. Even though we know we might not have the right package in to run that play and get a touchdown, or we're wishing it, I see it all the time in the South. People love snow here. They want snow. So the forecast may not really call for a lot of snow, but they're wish casting and they're texting me or DMing me. Hey, Dr. Shepard, are we going to get snow? I'm like, nah, probably not. But, but this is what the model said. I'm like, I got you, but it's not probably going to snow. But that's wish casting. And I think we're seeing a little wish casting with coronavirus right now. I think we're all tired and bored and stuck in the house. And we just really need to get back to, to normal here because, man, the economy is, is hurting and people are hurting and jobs are at stake. So totally understand that. But we have to keep in contact the fact that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. And then there's preparation, skill, and analysis. Those are things that are going to determine how we see the answers to these questions that I just posed. So here's a look at George's sort of trend in coronavirus. Uh, I, I wanted to use this contemporary complex science problem because science is really going to help us get out of this mess. And so we can't fear science. We can't see it as the enemy, but we need to understand it because I've seen people all over social media and in my direct messages and so forth that are misinterpreting science. I mean, it's all in front of us, all these trend lines and exponential growth curves and model projections. But it's really illustrating that there's a challenge in how we have to communicate this information. 
And so this is why if you look at this graph here, it shows you, it's a, it's a survey done by the AAAS, the organization that I got one of those awards for, and it shows the difference in how scientists on the right with the white dot perceive certain topics versus the public. So look at climate change. 87% of us who, that are actually climate scientists understand that there's a human contribution there, but only at the time of the survey, at least 50% of the public thought that. How did we get here? How did we get here that people honestly believe they actually have a better feel for what's going on in science than the scientists? I mean, that's like me taking a survey and saying, look, I think I can put in my garbage disposal in my kitchen better than a plumber can. I can't, I'm not a plumber. I, I trust the expertise of that plumber. But that's kind of where we are. And again, if you sort of step back and look at what's going on with coronavirus, I mean, you've got lifelong infectious disease experts at NIH and CDC, University of Georgia, telling us certain things, but yet people are sort of saying other things because they have maybe wish casting or maybe misinterpreting the data. So I deal with this all the time. This slide here shows you the various expertise for weather and climate. Now, I can't tell you how many times I have people that come up to me and say, hey, Dr. Shepard, what do you think of the groundhog's forecast for spring? I said, I think it's a rodent. Rodents can't predict the weather. But yet it's a part of folklore and it's certainly part of the things that people are familiar with, just like the farmer's almanac. I have people that come up to me all the time and say, yeah, yeah, the farmer's almanac says this. I was like, Farmer's Almanac is about 37% accurate based on studies. But people grew up with the Farmer's Almanac. I guarantee you some people listening to this right now, have, raise your hand, I can't see you, but raise your hand if you've heard the term heat lightning. Some people are shaking their head, oh yeah, I've heard of that. It's not a thing, it's not a thing. Um, heat lightning is simply lightning that's too far away for us to hear the thunder. But there are people, you know, our uncles and cousins all these years have told us, oh yeah, it's heat of the day, it's causing this lightning. So we deal with these things that I call perceptions in science. And so the first challenge, I'm gonna go through these quickly because I don't have a lot of time, but we can deal with some of this in the question and answer. The first challenge in communicating science, complex science topic, is we've got to overcome perceptions in psychology. I'll deal with climate change first and now I'll come back to COVID. I get people all the time that come to me and say, well, Dr. Shep, the climate change is naturally. I mean, what are you guys talking about, this global warming stuff or climate change? You guys changed the name of it, didn't you? No, we didn't, but that's certainly something I hear a lot of too. But climate change is natural. You can see it. This is the last 800,000 years. And look, the G's that you see, those are the ice ages, our interglacials and our glacials. That happens because of changes in the Earth's orbit, the Milankovic cycles. But if you look to the right, you can see that after 1850, we've seen something that's outside of this natural bound. And so, yes, climate change is naturally, but we've got a human steroid on top of it right now. The thing that I always like to say is grass grows naturally too, but when we fertilize our lawn, it grows differently. And that's kind of how you have to think about what, what we're doing to our climate system. Think about a baseball player. Baseball players could hit home runs naturally. But in the steroid era, they were hitting longer ones and more of them. And so there's nothing inherently that says humans can't change naturally varying systems. And so that's what we are dealing with with climate. Now let's talk about COVID-19. Now, we, we know that social distancing measures and wearing masks and these types of things, the whole point of social distancing and, and these measures was to flatten the curve. You heard a lot of talk about earlier in the period about flattening the curve. And so that's, that's what the experts tell us we need to be doing. Now, understandably, there are policy implications too because we've got to get the economy going and we've got to get people back to work. So there's a fine balance, and I don't envy the policymakers between the science and also the economy, but that's what the science tells, tells us. But back to that question about climate change, because I get people all the time that ask me, Dr. Shepard, do you believe in climate change? Well, I say, well, my son used to believe in the tooth fairy, and I was giving out a lot of dollars what he did. Science isn't a belief system. We, we don't, I don't believe that if I go to the top of my house and jump off that all of a sudden gravity doesn't exist anymore. I'm gonna fall if I jump. So we gotta remove this notion of a belief system. We believe in the tooth fairy. Another thing that's complex that's related to perception and bias is we, by our very nature, have not experienced anomaly events. That's why they're called anomalies. So this is a picture of Houston, Texas after Hurricane Harvey. Look at the flooded, flooded interstate there and people trying to drive through it. I don't know why we do that. But 
We've not experienced a Hurricane Harvey. We haven't experienced a COVID-19, but people do something called normalcy bias and optimism bias. They're like, oh yeah, I've experienced rain and floods before. Oh, we've had the flu before, so it's gonna be all right. But they're, they're placing their experience on their normalcy bias as opposed to anomalies. Then they also exhibit optimism bias. Like, you know, this happens when Powerball's at like $250 million and everybody rushes out to buy a lottery tickets. You're not probably gonna win that, but yet people feel they have a chance, a better chance of winning lottery than their house being flooded so they don't buy flood insurance. That's optimism bias. We have a sort of a skewed perspective that the outcome is going to be better than sort of the odds would say they're going to be. So be aware of those normalcy and optimism biases. Couple of other things about weather and perception. Remember snowpocalypse from a few years ago here in Georgia? All two inches of it shut us down, right? Part of the challenge there is people didn't understand the difference between watch advisory and warning. We were under initially a winter storm watch, but as conditions, the model said things were gonna get worse, we went from a, to an advisory and people perceived that that was, oh, some kind of downgrade. It didn't sound as scary. Oh, okay, we're getting better. When in fact, an advisory is worse than a watch, right? And so that's one of the things that we have to deal with when we're talking about weather in terms of complex issues. And I deal with it all the time with things like tornado watch versus warning or hurricane watch. So I'm about to put up something that's going to change your life. Get ready for it. Grab onto your seat if you have to. I'm about to change your life with something that I'm going to put up in the next slide if you have trouble distinguishing between watch and warning. There it is, boom. This little graphic should help you for the rest of your life remember the difference between tornado watch and tornado warning or hurricane watch and hurricane warning. Because a watch means it's the conditions or ingredients are there for that particular weather event. Warning means it's happening. So here we have cupcake watch ingredient, cupcake warning, we have cupcake. So hopefully that little example will help you because it can be confusing with some of our jargon. Perception issues exist in climate change. People think it's about polar bears or it's about the year 2080 or so when in fact our economy, our agricultural productivity, our health, our, our, um, tra our air travel, our extreme weather events are all linked to climate change today, not in the year 2080. And that little fellow, the polar bear, is not the only one feeling impacts. And so here we get to COLA, because you're probably wondering, how did he get COLA in that title? Well, look at what this um, Jeff C. Wright said, a former executive of Coca-Cola. He talked about how uh, their bottom line, this is a New York Times article, by the way, their bottom line was dramatically impacted by changes in climate because they use things like water and sugar beets, and they own Minute Maid, which uses fruit, for example, and these things are all very sensitive to climate. So I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna walk through all of those. There are some other challenges though that we, and I'm gonna shut this down so we can have questions. You gotta also be aware of your cognitive biases. I, I don't have time to go through this today in this talk, but if you go to Google and search my name and TED, I, I have a TED talk out there that I gave at TEDx UGA a couple of years ago on three biases that shape our perspectives on science. And I talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I mentioned earlier, which is that people think they know more than they do about to topics and overestimate that knowledge. For example, just, just coming back to contemporary times, coronavirus, how many times have you seen your Facebook friend or your cousin post something inaccurate about coronavirus? That's an example of the Dunning-Kruger effect. I see it all of the time. Then there's something called confirmation bias. We look for information that is consistent with what we already believe, whether it be the outcome of coronavirus, climate change, the type of news we consume, what stations and media outlets we read, et cetera. And then you know, there's this sort of ultimate, ultimate cognitive dissonance here, and I mentioned the groundhog earlier. I've actually had people come up to me and say, I don't believe in that climate change stuff, that's a hoax. And then in the next breath, they ask me about the groundhog forecast. Now, if that's not the ultimate cognitive bias, I don't know what is. The other challenges I'm just gonna summarize, I don't have time to do them. Scientists, us, we have to do a better job at communicating. We can't use all the graphs and jargon that we use. That's something that we're really bad at, but we're getting better at it. Some of us know how to do both. And if you're interested in more on that, check out an article I wrote in Forbes called Nine Tips for Communicating Science to Non-Scientists. I go through that quite clearly. 
We've got challenges with science literacy, and boy, I'm seeing that a lot with COVID-19. People in terms of how they interpret uncertainty, the models, prediction. People want very absolute predictions. Science doesn't work that way, whether it's coronavirus or weather or climate. We have to give you a best estimate with some uncertainty bounds on top of it. And then there's the zombie theories. There, zombies was in the title. This is my last one. I hear climate zombie theories all the time. Oh, Dr. Shepard, it's the sun, or climate changes naturally, or it's going to be good for us. Why are you guys all so worried? These are zombie theories. And I call them zombie theories if you walk, watch The Walking Dead because they Zombies, they all, they're dead, but they just never go away. They just keep coming back at you. And these theories that I hear in climate come at us all the time too. So that is really a quick overview of some of the challenges that I see. And hopefully I've given you some thinking in terms of how to get beyond these as we continue to engage uh, in an era in which we're gonna be dealing with complex science topics like weather forecasting and climate change and coronaviruses, this version and future versions, and other viruses. And so we have to make sure as a public, an educated public, as a bulldog patient, that we're asking the right questions, consuming the data in the right, and not wish casting it. So thank you for listening, and I'm excited about the opportunity to, to take some questions now. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. We really appreciate your time with this. And we, um, I have the question and answer um, module up. So if you have questions, please forward those to me until I get a few. Um, Dr. Shepard, please share with us. Um, I learned the other night that um, by watching television that you have co-written a book with your wife, 40 Days and 40 Nights, Daily Tales and Life Lessons. Would you please tell us about that, please? Yeah, you know, my wife was just posting on Facebook every day what was going on here is our family of four was quarantined like everybody else. And about day 10 in, I just started writing. I was like, there's some real lessons in each of those. So I just started expanding on it and writing about it and asking challenging, challenging questions that from the perspective of you as someone that might read the book. And so we got to 40 days, I think up around the time that Governor Kemp sort of started relaxing some of the um, uh, restrictions and so you know we started writing, writing the book and we wrote it up self-published it and it's available uh, all the proceeds were are giving to charities that are helping with students or with uh, for frontline emergency workers or medical workers because we just felt helpless we wanted to do something to help others and so that book's out there on Amazon if anyone's interested perfect thank you we do have a question that says your articles in Forbes are factual measured and informative. How do you emotionally deal with the articles in Forbes that are the opposite on the same topics that you cover? Well, I, I, I know the t tenor of what that person's getting at in that question because there's kind of a mixed history of where some of the articles in, in that particular outlet have been on, on some of the topics that I write about. But I think what you should take from the fact that I write for Forbes and that Forbes has an entire Forbes science section now is they realized that they had some issues. And so how I got came to write for Forbes after my year as president of the American Meteorological Society, I started hosting a TV show on the Weather Channel called Weather Geeks. And Forbes, a guy from Forbes saw some of my writing in the blogs that I would write for that TV show. And he's like, I love your writing. Would you write for Forbes or standing up a Forbes science? And we want actual scientists writing for us. We don't want opinionators or contributors that have opinions on climate or COVID-19, but haven't studied it or aren't sort of on, in the trenches working on the problem. And so I guess what you should take away from my answer is that Forbes recognized the issue. And so now they have a very credible, robust set of contributors, actual scientists and professors. Oh, I should mention, by the way, that we have another UGA professor, um, Jeffrey uh, Dorman, Jeff Dorman, that writes for Forbes as well, not in the science section as well. So Bulldog Nation is all over Forbes. Our DNA, our paw prints are everywhere. Love it, love it, thank you. Um, another question, um, just to let everybody know, we will be sending um, emailing every, every participant a survey about this session. And in that uh, information, we will provide links to the geography department at UGA and hopefully some of your slides, including any graphs that you might have. And also the Atmospheric Sciences Program, which I'm the director of, has a website too, if you can include that. 
Perfect, perfect. So we will include that in information that we will send to all the participants in today's session. Um, on another question, it says, will this year's hurricane season be more intense than usual? And how will it affect us with the COVID pandemic? Thanks, yeah, thanks Mike for that question. I actually wrote an article about that. You can Google out there in Forbes. Uh, right now, the, the folks at Colorado State University and NOAA who do these seasonal projections for the hurricane season do project a slightly normal to above normal hurricane season. And that is because right now we aren't in an El Nino. When we're in an El Nino, that tends to reduce activity some. We're not in El Nino. And in fact, I saw some hints the other day that we might slip into a La Nina phase, which actually would make the hurricane season more active as well. So we're going to be watching it, but I always don't get too carried away with how active the season is because it only takes one. It only takes one Michael or Maria or, Hur or Hurricane Harvey. And we've already seen, we're off to an early start with Hur uh, Tropical Storm Arthur, um, but that doesn't mean anything. Don't take too much from the fact that we started early. Now, the other side of that is with COVID-19. I mean, think about FEMA and first responders and medical folks that are in places that deal with hurricanes. They're already stretched to the limit dealing with COVID-19. So we pray that there will not be a hurricane affecting a Miami or a Houston or a North Carolina coast, because then that's just gonna stretch resources even more thin when people are already hurting, out of work, economically deprived. So. The good news is, and here's the good news, it's somewhat speculative, the peak of the hurricane season is typically not until early September-ish, mid-September. I am hoping that COVID-19 will have waned a bit by that point so that we're not dealing with an overlap here. There's sort of one transition to the other. And of course, COVID's still gonna be around some, but I'm just hoping we get beyond the peak, which it, the models project we will, and then hurricane season starts ramping up in September and October. Let's hope that you are correct. Yes, I hope sir. so. I, I hope so. Yes, sir. And uh, Mary is asking, are we wish casting when we think summer weather, like heat and the humidity, will decrease the COVID-19 virus viability? Yeah, I, this is Mary. This is something I've been thinking a lot about as a meteorologist and atmospheric scientist, because the conventional wisdom is that the flu season and the cold season is not that bad as we get into the warmer season, right, in the late spring and early summer. However, as the CDC website points out, we don't understand coronavirus or, or SARS-CoV-2 to understand whether heat is going to impact it in the same way. Here's a bit of just data from my own observations as a scientist. If you look at April in Florida and April in the desert Southwest, they had record breaking heat. Florida was breaking heat records all over the place. Parts of the Southwest were in the 100s degrees, yet they were still dealing with coronavirus. If you look at some of the tropical nations around the globe early on in the outbreak in Asia, it was warm there. They were still dealing with coronavirus. If you look down in New Zealand and some of those places back in the when the when things were flipped. So the question is, I don't know. I think there is a little wish casting going on, or not even just wish casting. People are just applying their common knowledge about flu and cold and warm season to this. And it may be a little too early to do that. Now, having said that though, I did see a study that just came out that said uh, above a certain temperature, the, the, the virus doesn't do as well. This is a very new study. So it hasn't been vetted. It hasn't been replicated by others, but that's hopeful. One thing that I would recommend just anecdotally for you, uh, and one of our colleagues at UGA made this uh, made this point to me recently. The the really a rapid heat up around 130 to 150 degrees can kill the coronavirus on surfaces. So one thing that I have started doing is when I go out or when I when I'm not don't have my car in the garage, I leave my mask up on the dashboard of my car because our cars, there's some studies that we've done at UGA, heat up really fast in the sun because of that greenhouse effect. And you'd be surprised at how hot some of those temperatures can get in a car. That's why we unfortunately see kids left in cars sometimes and they perish, a very, very sad case. Cars can get up into the 120, 130, 150 Fahrenheit range very quickly. So we don't want to leave any pets, car, electronics, or people in hot cars, but that heat in a car might help us with our, our mask to help kill, kill coronavirus or even a, an Amazon package that you might have stick in your car for a while if you don't want to touch it, so. 
And speaking of mask, a question Taylor has brought up has the CDC has recommended that everyone wear a mask when they do go out in public to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Is that truly the best option? And if so, why? Well, I don't want to exhibit Dunning-Kruger effect here and sort of counter the experts at the CDC. So if the CDC is recommending it, I'm doing it. And so that's really the best answer I can give there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shepard, if members of our community who are here uh, with us today are interested in supporting any of your work or research, can you tell us the best way or, or how we can do this? Well, you could support our students. We actually have a you know, University of Georgia Atmospheric Sciences Fund at the U University of Georgia Foundation. Uh, your colleagues over there at Franklin College, Mick Cumbie and others, uh, help us with that. Uh, and, you know, we're always looking to, uh, the, for donations to that Atmospheric Sciences Fund. It primarily supports undergraduate research for our Atmospheric Sciences students, their travel when they have to go present their work at conferences and so forth. So uh, I, would, I would be very um, delighted if, if there are some people out there interested in supporting that effort. Alternatively, um, through Mick Cumbie, who works in the Franklin College, they're there are also possibly other vehicles if you wanted to donate. If there's a particular um, climate or weather related research sort of agenda, not agenda, that, that word sounds loaded, but research topic that you'd like to see us perhaps if we have the right expertise work on. I mean, we, we've got 10, eight to 10 faculty members in our atmospheric sciences program who are world renowned, by the way, Dr. John Knox, myself, Andy Grunstein, Tom Moat. Uh, Gabe Cooper, I can go on Gabe Cooperman, David Stuper. These are all award-winning faculty members that have won some of our highest awards in our field. So just rest assured all you UGA alumni out there, particularly Franklin College, University of Georgia has one of the best up-and-coming atmospheric sciences programs in the world. One of its faculty, me, has been the president of the American Meteorological Society, which is the top professional society in our field. And John Knox and myself and others have won some of the top awards in our field. So I don't say that to blow our own horn, although I want to blow the horn for our program. But I just want to assure you that we have a world-class program here at the University of Georgia. And many people may not be aware of it because it's relatively new. We're glad you're tooting your horn because otherwise we wouldn't know about it necessarily. So thank you. And like you said, um, I follow you on Twitter. And so I hope that our guests will follow you on Twitter as we're at Dr. Shepard 2013. Um, yeah, and then just Dr. with DR, the, just to abbreviate Dr. Shepard. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so Sean has asked a question that um, I had heard that current weather forecasting relies heavily on data from airplanes and that because fewer are currently in the sky, Forecasting is not as good during this time. Is this true? Sean, man, nice question. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of sort of don you an honorary weather geek because that's a, that's a pretty nice loaded question there. But the reality is our weather models, just let me give you a brief 101 on weather models because I get this question a lot. People like, how do we make weather forecasts? How do, I, how do you know what the weather's going to be this Sunday? Well, we use computer models. And these computer models saw very complex equations, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics equations. And we can run those model equations forward in time or even mixes of them, we call them ensembles, and predict how that atmospheric fluid changes one day out, three days out, seven days out. That's how a weather forecast is made. I'll give you an analogy. If we put a beach ball in the Mississippi River up in St. Paul, Minnesota, because I understand the Mississippi River's flow patterns, how fast it's flowing, its depth, et cetera, it's a fluid, I could theoretically predict where that beach ball would be down the river three days from now, just because I understand the, the physics of fluid. It's also why if you major in atmospheric sciences or meteorology, you gotta take a lot of physics and math. I break a lot of hearts in my office when someone comes in and say, I love weather and storm chasing and clouds. I want to be a meteorologist. And I said, that's good. But do you like calculus and physics and differential equations? Because that's, that's what you have to take. Now, with that setup, part of the initial data that goes into those weather models are weather balloon information that gives us information on the atmosphere, information on weather down at the surface, satellite information, data from buoys, and all kinds of things. But guess what? Every time you take off or land in an airplane, those airplanes are taking temperature and wind measurements, et cetera, that get fed into our, our prediction models. So because of COVID-19, there aren't as many planes taking off or landing. And so there's less information going into the model. And so uh, the Europeans, European model is technically the best weather model in the world. We use that one in the US models all. 
And they've done some preliminary studies that suggest that there should be a slight degradation in quality of weather forecast because of that lack of aircraft data going in. Now, we're doing things like taking additional data or putting more satellite data in. So I don't think we've seen a massive degradation, but I wouldn't be surprised over time if this continues that we see, see more of an example of that. And you touched a little bit on this, but just to reiterate, how does climate change, as Savannah is asking, have an impact on public health? Does well, it make it easier for viruses to spread? Well, not so much with the viruses. There's still work being done. But for example, there are some vectors, mosquitoes and ticks, that live in warm places. Like the mosquito, the vector that carries dengue fever usually hang out in places like much more south of here, maybe Costa Rica or the tropics. But as the temperature envelope moves further northward, that mosquito can maybe live in Georgia one day. We've seen isolated cases of dengue in Florida. So as we start moving further north of that warming envelope, we see incidences of increases in vector-borne diseases. I was at a conference one time in a hotel and there were all these Canadian doctors. And I'm like, what, what are you guys doing here? Like, we're, we're down here learning how to treat Lyme disease because the tick that carries Lyme disease didn't used to live in Canada, but now it's warm enough that it can. So that's one example from a health perspective. We see all kinds of others because we know that heat waves are going to be more intense and are more intense currently because of climate change. That leads to heat mortality and heat morbidity related issues, heat stresses and, and so forth. And so that's a, a heat challenge as well. We also know that there, we're gonna see sh some shifts in agricultural productivity in some parts of the world, particularly some of the uh, developing parts of the world. And so there could be some nutrition and drought related issues there that can exacerbate uh, underlying health issues too. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, another question, Nancy, thank you for this. How do you see instruction evolving at UGA to educate students about some of the information biases so that they will become more aware of their influences and think more critically? And thank you, she says, for addressing the humidity question. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You know, one of the things that's very important for instructors and professors is to, to be just instructors and professors. Don't bring in your political biases. Don't bring in your other biases. Just teach the kids based on the facts and the data. And one of the things that I inherently believe the, the, the value of higher education does is students learn to ask questions and use their critical thinking skills. One of the things that scares me about the current society that we live in to some degree is, boy, I'm seeing a, a lack of not using those critical thinking skills out there. I think people just buy whatever they, they see or immediately hit the forward or share button without saying, wait a minute, does that sort of pass the smell test? And so um, I think, again, it's important, you know, when, when I'm in a, teaching these classes, I, I teach to the data and teach to the facts. Um, there's something that you often hear that comes up when I, for example, I just in November, I testified before the House Science mm -hmm. Committee on Capitol Hill in Congress about extreme weather. And something came up about, well, don't you think we should show both sides of the climate change discussion? That's the classic example of something called false equivalency. Now, of course, in science, we have to be skeptical and question everything. But when 95 to 97% of climate scientists publishing in the peer reviewed literature have sort of said what's happening and given various pieces of evidence to show that, it's not 50-50. So that's why sometimes when CNN will ask me to come on with a climate skeptic on one side and me on the other side, I often decline those because it gives my mom, who's sitting there watching CNN or Fox or MSNBC, it gives her a perception that there are two sides of the climate change issue that are equally weighted, when actually it's 97 versus three. And so we have to, at the end of the day, I don't believe we should indoctrinate kids at all in a higher ed environment. We should teach kids how to think and then teach them where to find the information, data, and methods to answer their own questions. Yes. Um, we're, we have a few more minutes. Um, Peyton is asking, can you speak to how our lack of movement and the shutting down of cities has positively affected the environment? And can we continue that positive trend past COVID? Hey, Peyton, great question. Yeah, we're seeing evidence that we're seeing less air pollution, the improved air quality, perhaps uh, slightly less uh, carbon emissions because we've been moving around less. Those are good things. 
I think the positive in that, if we can find the positive in this negative, is that it shows people that our activities do influence the weather, climate, and environment. Because I get people all the time to say, well, I, I just don't believe we, are, we have the ability to affect the weather and climate. Or I, I think it's blasphemous to say that we can. Well, I think this little period of time has kind of, it's been an experiment that shows that, shows that we do. Unfortunately, Peyton, I also believe that as we start to normalize, I think that things are gonna kind of jump back, back to where they were. I think that's just naturally going to happen. But I hope from that, policymakers and stakeholders and the public sees that, oh, we can, if we do certain things, make a difference to our environment. Just like my colleague in engineering, Jenna Jambeck over at the College of Engineering at UGA, she's really concerned about plastics in the ocean. And so there are things that can be done to help with that. And so hopefully this, is, this little test case that we've seen during coronavirus can show people and policymakers that there are things that we can do to sustain those improvements. Because as right now, I think it's just a blip. And last question, I think, based on time, to go along with that, it's been asked, can you talk about that influence of sustaining or continuing the planned continuation bias during these unprecedented times when we are learning new things about COVID-19 daily and having to update policy accordingly? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'll, I'll, I'll try to frame that question, but I, I think with COVID-19 and with climate change, what, how I will address that question, because I don't know, I, I don't have all the answers here, but I just want us to get back to a point where policy is being informed by science and that science and methodology is respected, not seen as the enemy. And interestingly enough, I thought with COVID-19 that was going to happen. When this first started happening, I told my wife, I was like, this, this, I think people are going to really see that science is going to be important because science is going to get us out of this with vaccines and with other things that are being medications. That's all science. And as I often tell people, look, our vaccines and our, our iPhones and our GPSs and our cars, they don't come poof from the science theory. They come from years and years of research and development at the University of Georgia in government labs and private industry. And so we have to continue to maintain and support the R&D infrastructure so that we're ready, locked and loaded and ready for the next coronavirus or, or the next sort of extreme weather event that's fueled by climate change. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. We have learned, I know I have learned so much from you and just to know that, you know, not to fear science and, uh, and to learn that there's no such thing as heat lightning. That's, that is something new for me as well. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> well, so thank you again. And, and if I did not get to everyone's questions, um, I will try to make note um, and we will try to get those questions answered for you uh, and possibly let you know those answers specifically. Um, and like I mentioned before, we will be sending um, a survey after this in the next few days. Um, with pertinent information about today's session and we'll try to include that. Dr. Shepard, do you have any further, anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, no, I'm, unfortunately, I, I you know, see some questions we didn't get to, but definitely follow me out there on Twitter at Dr. Shepard 2013. If you tweet at me, I usually respond pretty quickly. So happy to, you know, answer or address some of those questions if I didn't get to them here in this format uh, as well. And just thank you all. Um, no, look, let's, let's try to, at the end of the day, you know, we're different races, we're of different political perspectives and faiths and cultures, but we're all one bulldog nation. Let's be an educated bulldog nation on science. Love that. Thank you again, Dr. Shepard. And like you said, thank you to our viewers. Um, please um, check out the Franklin College website and that of the Geography Department and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, again, we'll send you some of that information just to keep you informed or to help support our college's work. And I'd like to remind our viewers that today that, um, that today's presentation is part of the Ask Me Anything series. So please check out upcoming sessions at alumni.uga.edu. Thank you again. Thank you all and go dogs. <laughs>